Hello, Mark. I'm Amy, and my student number is 49. And right now, I'm junior. And I'm going to read in Kurzan what makes a word real. Okay. Fiend March 2014 at TED U of M. In Kurzan, what makes a word real? Subtitles and transcripts select language English. I need to start by telling you a little bit about my social life, which I know may not seem relevant, but it is. When people meet me at parties and they find out that I'm an English professor who specializes in language, they generally have one or two reactions. One set of people look frightened. After. They often say something like, oh, I'd better be careful what I say, I'm sure you'll hear every mistake I make. And then they stop talking. Laughter. And they wait for me to go away and talk to someone else. The other set of people, their eyes light up and they say, you're just a person I want to talk to. And then they tell me about whatever it is they think is going wrong with the English language. Laughter. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a dinner party and a man to... And the man to my right started telling me about all the ways that the internet is degrading the English language. He brought up Facebook and he said, To different? I mean, is that even a real word? I want to pause on that question. What makes a word real? My dinner companion and I both know what the verb different means. So when, when does a new word like different become real? Who has the authority to make those kinds of official decisions about words, anyway? Those are the questions I want to talk about today. I think most people, when they say word isn't real, what they mean is it doesn't appear in a standard dictionary. That, of course, raises a host of other questions, including who writes dictionaries? Before I go any further, let me to clarify my role in all of this. I do not write dictionaries. I do, however, collect new words much the way dictionary editors do. And a great thing about being a historian of the English language is that I get to call this research. When I teach the history of the English language, I require the students to teach me two new slang words before I will begin class. Over the years, I have learned some great new slang this way, including hangry, which, a boss, which is when you are cranky or angry because you are hungry and adorable. Which is when you are adorable is kind of dorky way, clearly terf terf terrific words that fill important gaps in the English language. Laughter. But how rare are they if we use them primarily as land and they don't get they don't yet appear in a dictionary? With that, let's turn to dictionaries. I'm going to do this as a show of hands. How many of you still regularly refer to a dictionary, either print or online? Okay, so that works like most of you. Now a second question, again, a show of hands. How many of you have ever looked to see who edited the dictionary you're using? Okay, many fewer. At some level, we know that there are human hands behind dictionaries, but we're really not sure who those hands belong to. I'm actually fascinated by this. Even the most critical people out there tend not to be very critical about dictionaries, not distinguishing among them and not asking a whole whole lot of questions about who edited them. Just think about the phrase, look it up in a dictionary, which suggests that all dictionaries are exactly the same. Consider a library here on campus where you go into a reading room and there is a large unabridged dictionary up on a pedestal in this place of honor and respect line open so we can go stand before it go before it to get answers. Now, but don't get me wrong, dictionaries are fantastic resources, but they are human and they're not timeless. I'm struck as a teacher that we tell students to critically question every text they read, every website they visit, expect dictionaries, which we tend to treat as unauthored as if they came from nowhere to give us answers about what words really mean. Here's the thing. If you ask dictionary editors, what they will tell you is they're just trying to keep up with us. We change the language. They're watching what we say and what we write and trying to figure out what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. They have to gamble. 
because they want to appear cutting edge and cast the words that are going to make it, such as LLL. But they don't want to appear fetish and include the words that aren't going to make it. And I think the word that they're watching right now is YOLO. You only live once. Now I got to hand out with dictionary editors. And you might be surprised by one of the places where we hand out. Every January, we go to American Di Dialogue Social Annual Meeting, where among other things, we vote on the word of the year. There are about 200 or 300 people who come, some of the best known linguists, linguists in the United States. To give you a sense of the flavor of the meeting, it occurs right before happy hour. Anyone who comes can vote. The most important rule is that you can vote with only one hand. In the past, some of the winners have been tweeted in 2009 and hashtag in 2012. Chat was the word of the year in that year 2000, because who knew what a chat was before 2000 and WMD in 2002. Now, we have other categories in which we vote to, and my favorite category is most creative word of the year. Past winners in this category have included recombobulation area, which is at the Milwaukee airport after security, where you can recombobulate, recombobulate laughter. You can put your belt back on, put your computer back in your bag, and then my all-time favorite word is this vote, which is multi-slacking laughter. And multi-slacking is the act of having multiple windows on up on your screen so it looks like you're working when you're actually goofing around the web. Laughter, applause. Will all of these words stick? Absolutely not. And we have made some questionable choices. For example, in 2006, when the word of the year was plutoed, to mean demoted, laughter. The sound of the past winners that now seem completely unmarkable, such as app and e as prefix and Google as a verb. Now, a few weeks before our vote, Lake Superior State University issues its list of banished words for the year. What is striking about this is that there are actually often quite a lot of overlap between their list and the list that we are considering for words of the year. And this is because we are noticing the same thing. We are noticing words that are coming into prominence. It's really a question of attitude. Are you bothered by language fads and language change? Or do you find it fun interesting? Something worthy of study as part of a living language. The list by Lay Superior State University continues a fairly long tradition in English of complaints about new words. So here is Dane Henry offered in 1875 was very concerned that desirability is really a terrible word. In 1760, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to David Hume giving up the word colonize as bad. Over the years, we're, we've also seen worries about new pronunciations. Here is Samuel Rogers in 1855 who is concerned about some fashionable pronunciations that he finds offensive, and he says, as if contemplated were not bad enough. Balcony makes me sick. Laughter. The word is borrowed in from Italian, and it was pronounced balcony. These complaints now strike us as quaint, if not downright accordable, Adorkable laughter, but here's the thing, we still get quite worked up about language change. I have an entire file in my office of newspaper articles which express concern about in illegitim illegitimate words that should not have been included in a dictionary, such as laugh aloud, when it got into the Oxford English Dictionary and different when it got into the Oxford American Lit Dictionary. I also have articles expressing concern about invite as a noun, impact as a verb, because only teeth can be impacted, and incentivize is described as boorish, bureaucratic misspeak. Now, it is not that dictionary editors ignore these kinds of attitudes about language. They try to provide us some guidance about words that are considered slang or informal or offensive, often through usage labels. But there is something of a 
find because they're trying to describe what we do and they know what we often do to dictionaries to get information about how we should use a word well or appropriately. In response, the American Heritage Dictionaries include usage notes. Usage notes tend to occur with words that are troublesome in some way, in one way. And one of the ways that they can be troublesome is that they are changing meaning. Now, usage notes involve very human decisions. And I think, as dictionary users, we're often not as aware of those human decisions as we should be. To show you what I mean, we'll look at an example. But before we do, I want to explain what the dictionary editors are trying to deal with in these usage notes. Think about the word preuse and how you use that word. I should guess many of you are thinking of scheme scan reading quickly. Some of you may even have some walking involved because you are perusing grocery store shelves or something like that. You might be surprised to learn that if you look in most standard dictionaries, the first def definition will, to, will be to read carefully or pour over. American Heritage has that as the first def definition. They then have as a second definition scheme, and next to that, they say usage problem laughter. And they and then they include a usage note which is worth looking at. So here's the uses note usage note. Preuse has long meant to read thoroughly, but the word is often used more loosely to mean simply to read. Further extension of the word to mean to glance over skin has traditionally been considered an error. But our ballot results suggest that it is becoming somewhat more acceptable. When asked about the sentence, I only had a moment to produce the manual quickly. 66% of the usage panel found it unacceptable in 1988, 59% in 1999, and 48% in 2011. Ah, the usage panel. That trusted body of language authorities who is getting more lenient about this. Now, what I hope you're thinking right now is, wait, who's on the usage panel? And what I, uh, what should I do with their pronouncements? If you look in the front matter of American Heritage Dictionaries, you can actually find the names of the people on the usage panel. But who looks at the front matter of dictionaries? There are about 200 people on the usage panel. They include academ uh, academicians, journalists, creative writers. There are Supreme Court justices on it and a few linguists. As for 2005, the list includes me. Applause. Here's what we can do for you. We can give you a sense of the range of opinions about contested usage. That is and should be the extent of our authority. We're not a language academy. About once a year, I get a ballot that asks me about whether new uses, new pronunciations, new meanings are acceptable. Now, here's what I, I do to fill out the ballot. I listen to what other people are saying and writing. I do not listen to my own likes and dislikes about English language. I will be honest with you. I do not like the word impactful, but that is neither here or nor there in terms of whether impactful is becoming common usage and becoming more acceptable in written prose. So to be responsible, what I do is go look at usage, which of it involves going to look at online this databases such as Google Books. Well, if you look for impactful in Google Books, here's what you find. Well, it sure looks like impactful is pro proving useful for a certain number of writers and has become more and more useful over the last 20 years. Now, there are going to be changes that all of us don't like in language. There are going to be changes where you think, really? Does the language have to change that way? What I'm saying is we should be less quick to decide that that change is terrible. We should be less quick to impose our likes and dislikes about words only on other people. And we should be entirely re reluctant to think that English language is in trouble. It's not. It's, it's not. 
It is rich and vibrant and filled with the creativity of the speakers who speak it. In retrospect, we think it's fascinating that the word nice used to mean silly, and that the word decimate used to mean to kill one in every ten. Laughter. We think that Ben Franklin was being silly to worry about notice as a verb. Well, you know what? We're going to look pretty silly in a hundred years for worrying about impact as a verb and invite as a noun. The language is not going to change so fast that we can't keep up. Language just doesn't work that way. I hope that what you can do is find language change not worrisome but fun and fascinating. Just the way dictionary editors do. I hope you can enjoy being part of the creativity that is continual, continually remaking our language and keeping it robust. So how does a word get into a dictionary? It gets in because we use it and we keep using it. And dictionary editors are paying attention to us. If you're thinking, but that lets all of us decide what words means. I should say, yes it is and it always has. Dictionaries are a wonderful guide and resource, but there is no objective dictionary authority out there that there that is the final arbiter about what words mean. If a community of speakers is using a word and knows what it means, it's real. The word might be slangy, the word might be informal, that word might be a word that you think is illogical or unnecessary. But that word that we're using, that word is real. Thank you. Applause.